You're tuned into the BSX Digital Sports Network. You're listening to the boss of the big four. JP the Tech Boss of the Midboard is back, JP the ticket, Vegas Scoreboard Express, going into the conversation series, Bread and Circus, talking March Madness 2022, it's back, the fans are back, and I'm glad you're back with us here, go to the website, VegasScoreboardExpress.com, I've got conference tournament tickets, I've also got tickets so you can go to the games live, March Madness, a little bit different. Okay, in this segment again, Vegas Scoreboard Express, the conversation series, Bread and Circus. And today I've also got a special guest with us. He was here for the Super Bowl, Linwood Hard Rock Hamilton, a.k.a. the defender of the youth, Philly's finest, one of the best that ever did it on the football field. But most importantly, he's got a story to tell and you guys are going to want to tune in over the next few weeks. And to listen to what he's saying so you can get a better understanding of what's going on in college athletics as a whole, but especially for us former hardcore college basketball fans who are watching our sport go in a direction that many of us don't agree with, I'm going to help explain it. National, name, image, and likeness deals. Now they're paying the college athletes. How valuable is that to the athlete? How valuable is that to the sport? And in relationship to March Madness, who are these guys? There's a ton of players out there we've never heard of, and there are reasons why. So without further ado, we're bringing in my guest today, Lynn Wood, Hard Rock, Hamilton, defender of the youth. He is the guy that's going to be talking to us today about his experiences coming up as a young inner city athlete from Philadelphia and the uh, deep south down in Louisiana. Went to NC State, played a little bit for the Edmonton Eskimos, now called the Edmonton Elks, and the Philadelphia Eagles. So again, Linwood, glad to have you back with us. How you doing? Bring it on, sucker. That's my kind of shit. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Linwood Hamilton, defender of the youth. You guys are rocking with JB the Ticket, boss of the big board, Vegas School Board Express, the conversation series. You don't hear a lot of sound effects. You're not going to hear a lot of the bells and whistles. We're not betting. And I'm giving you straight grease. I'm breaking it down for you so you can understand why the sports that you're watching look, feel, and even sound different. But most importantly, Linwood, glad to have you back. And if you haven't heard Linwood, he's an excellent football prognosticator, a.k.a. handicapper. Listen to his analysis on the Super Bowl. Talking the experiences of a man who has lived, who has been through some things, and I'm telling you, stay tuned to this show segment series with Linwood Hard Rock Hamilton, Defender of the Youth, and you're going to have a clear understanding of what's going on in sports, at least from the perspective of JB the Ticket. So again, Linwood, thank you for being on the show with me today. So I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Just tell the fans a little bit about your background, how you came with that name, Hard Rock Hamilton, Defender of the Youth. And then we're going to jump into your commentary on the state of college sports, the NIL deals, anything in relationship to the athletes and the type of athletes that are coming in. So again, Linwood, go ahead. Glad to be here with you. And I appreciate you having me on your show. And uh, well, how long we got? Because I got a whole lot of stuff, but I'll I, I cut it down. We got um, as much time as you need. This is not a sports betting segment. This is a conversation series. So we're going to hit all of the pertinent points. I want my listeners to know that, yes, not only can I tell you how to win bets, but I'm also a very astute observer of the sports world and the sports business. We've got all the time in the world, Linwood. Go ahead. Okay, first of all, I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and uh, uh, I grew up in 11. My mom gave me up to two and a half and a, uh, to a very abusive uncle and sent me to Chicago, Grand Junction, Michigan, and I was the black sheep of the family, basically. But when, as I got older, you know, like I said, I grew up in 11 different children's homes, boys' homes. Once I found that I had athletic ability, I went to Town Holly, New Jersey, and I was a running back, and they compared me to Frank or Harris when I was a, was a young kid. I went to school with his younger brothers, Shazeppi and Pete, and left that home and moved on. And basically, I wind up, the last children's home that I was in was in Eastern Pennsylvania. The 
children's home of Easton. And I was a sprinter, a shot putter. I played basketball and I played football. And I could have went to college, you know, at the time that I'm only six, two and a half, six, three. You know, back then, that's when they had the small guard. And But I couldn't pat too good with both hands. I, I was good with my right. But if you led me to my left, I couldn't drive with that left. I went to basketball camp up at Mansfield State College with Coach Wilson, and uh, we learned a lot of basic stuff, you know, the triple threat and learned how to handle with both hands. And after I came back from camp, I thought I knew the basketball world, but I knew that football was a natural. You know, because I had animosity built up in me because I was a, a very badly abused child, not from the children's homes that I was in, but from my own family. Not Just terrible. From That's the... terrible. In the sports world, I do hear that a lot. So let's talk a little bit more about that football, because I know that from our records here, and again, you can check out Linwood Skip Hard Rock, defender of the Youth Hamilton story. He's got a website. You definitely want to go over and check it out. Linwood Hamilton. That's L-E-N, the word wood, like a tree. Hamilton, like that play everybody went to. Dot com and you'll be able to check out his story. But your football story is interesting to me because, again, Linwood, we're talking about college athletics today. We're going to get, of course, football with the NFL draft coming up, these NIL deals. But in your era, and if you don't mind telling the world listeners how old you are in the era in which you played, your high school time was very, very high level. You were one of the top 100 ranked players in the nation. Tell them about that. My senior year, I was a couple yards away from a thousand yard rusher, broke my ankle. I never reached that thousand yards. By the way, what high school were you playing for? Go ahead. Wilson High School in Easton, Pennsylvania. What happened was I broke my ankle. It healed by the time I went to college. But you got to understand something. My coach, his name was Pete Sikowski, he told me, he said, Skip, you're the kind of kid that if we put you in the right situation, you'll take advantage of an opportunity. And he was absolutely right. He went to North Carolina State, another coach by the name of Chucky Amato, who coached with Bobby Bowden and Bo Ryan. You remember the coach that got killed oh, yes. in the plane crash? He was my coach at NC State. And what they did is they, they gave me a scholarship. And I got recruited by every college in the country. As a matter of fact, they wanted me to replace Tony Dorsett at the University of Pitt at 6'2 and a half. 225, I was running a 4440. The only reason that my 100 time was slow as compared to my 40 time is because I did all the work on my own to build up that 100 time because the coach, I had to work out running hills and running 220s and practice and get my stuff together by myself. If I had had a coach to train me, I would have been in the nines. I wind up getting a scholarship to North Carolina State. And I can remember back in the day, you see, the type of athletes that these coaches would help were the kids from the hood. As a matter of fact, what they would do, they would come to the hood and discover all these kids, these kids that were good. And they would give them, they would sign them to these scholarships. And, and when, like when I went to NC State, you know, they couldn't give you money. They would give you alumni. Like I, like I was telling you earlier, they hooked me up with this. Uh, alumni, and I wasn't hip to it. I didn't know how to take advantage of that. Okay, but mm -hmm. with my academics, you know, I I didn't pay it no mind. I didn't I didn't play it the way most guys that would have known would have played it. Uh, we lived in a place called the College Inn, which was a hotel. Everybody else lived in the dorms. We lived in the College Inn, and uh, they would treat us special. When we ate, we ate great. We would have seafood night every Tuesday. There was nothing that a football player or a basketball player couldn't get when you were at NC State. I'm telling you, they, they treated us great. And uh, But it's not like that no more, man. I mean, yes, yeah. I, see the, I, see, I see the commercial with LeBron James' son, right? Talking about he going to the league. Back in the day, you know, you couldn't do that, man. Matter of fact, check this out. One of the greatest basketball players that ever played the game. Jelly Bean Joe Bryant, that's Kobe's dad. Rest in peace, Kobe. You Great. Understand? You know what I mean? And Kobe traveled around the world with his dad. But you didn't hear nothing about Jelly Bean bringing Kobe into this and bringing him in. Kobe worked for what he got. He played overseas. He went everywhere with his father. He worked his ass off, bro. Like I was telling you earlier, you know, Dale Dawkins, the only thing he did was rebound and slam dunked on you. Now he would be out there shooting three-pointers. Right. The game ain't like it used to be. You know, I worked hard to get where I was. Let me tell you something. I worked out three times a day. 
I was in the Lehigh Valley. I didn't run nothing but hills. I ran the same hill that the ex-champ, Larry Holmes, ran when he was a young boy becoming the heavyweight champ of the world. It was a mile hill, straight up. I ran that thing three, four times a week. You know, before we would go out partying and, you know what I mean, I would work out first to make sure that I was in shape. But you couldn't beat me by making me run sprints. And, man, I laughed at the coaches because I was ready. Listen to JB the Ticket, a.k.a. the boss of the big board, Vegas Scoreboard Express, the conversation series, Bread and Circus. Today we're talking with Lenwood, Hard Rock Hamilton, defender of the youth, former high-level college and pro football player. And we're talking about where college sports are at. And you touched on something, and you mentioned Kobe Bryant. It's called hunger. And when you talk about the era of the late 70s and the early 80s, the difference between the athletes then, the coaches then, was that the majority of your players came from the inner city. You could look at a college roster from the 1970s, the 80s, even the 90s, going up until maximum about 2015. The majority of those players would be from public high schools from around the nation. We've done our research. Anybody who wants to call me on that, let me know. There's a couple of reasons. Number one, these athletes' origins were primarily inner city, rural, and not necessarily financially advantaged. See, 20, 30, 40 years ago, the path of athletics was the path of the poor. It was the path of the hungry. Because the path was so slim to make it, that it was easily relatable to the path to become a pro athlete for many players, the path to find a meal that night. That same hunger, that same determination, that same willingness to take risks, to find food, clothing, a warm bed, translated into natural given ability and fire and drive to succeed in sports. And one of the things that I've seen change over the past 20 years, since I've been old enough to observe, I've found that these younger kids don't have that hunger. Now, in the course of this series, we're going to talk on this quite a bit, but I'm going to touch on a few things now. There's quite a few reasons why the new athlete isn't as the old athlete. Okay? Our news cycle carries different aspects of the news which are not necessarily athlete-focused. 20, 30 years ago, what a pro athlete did was front-page news. Now it's internet fodder. But for the high school athlete, the high-level high school athlete, these players were nationally known from the time that they set foot on that campus as super freshmen, diaper dandies, guys like Dick Vital, giving them the nicknames and giving them the hype that they needed. And a lot of this had to do with the backgrounds of these children. Because it's funny, I, I, I think about that Duke team uh, when I watched 30 for 30 about Duke. And how everyone thought that that Duke team was full of rich kids and full of kids from prep school. And then when you looked at that roster of those teams that won those national championships in the early 90s, these were all public school kids. Even Christian Leitner, when he told his story, he's like, my dad was, we didn't have any money. We were always in debt. And you think about that and you go, wow, you look at these kids from that era who got all the, you guys are the elites, you guys are the cream of the crop. But then when the curtains are pulled back 20, 30 years later and they tell their story and you're like, wait a minute. Because again, back then, that was just a part of the fabric. When you looked at, especially for the black athlete and the rural poor white athlete, everybody talks about Larry Bird. French Lick, Indiana. If you can find it on a map, I'll give you 50 bucks on Cash App. A small, poor town. Guy shooting jumpers on a hoop on a tree. One of the best shooters. And even as a coach, he proved his medal. He coached in the NBA Finals. He lost, but he still made it there. The guy was a winner all around. But look at the hunger he had from French Lick, Indiana. Moving bales of hay, cleaning pig poop. He won it out. You look at a guy like Magic Johnson. Said that he saw black businessmen in his neighborhood and he wanted to be just like them. That hunger to be more than what you come from. That was the athlete of 20 to 30 years ago. Whether it be college football, basketball, baseball. You look at a guy like Deion Sanders, prime time, shout out prime time, going to Florida State, his mom working two, three jobs to give him the lifestyle image that he wanted to push. Mom, get me a little gold chain. Mom, get me a little LeBaron drop top. Play for the Falcons. Play for the Yankees. You never know where you catch Deion. But that's what I'm talking about. It was the hunger of that athlete. And again, you mentioned Kobe Bryant. God rest Kobe Bryant's soul. Kobe Bryant, that hunger from the time he was the child of an NBA player, an overseas player, professional athlete, that hunger carried him all the way 
until his untimely demise because he had something to prove to himself and to the greater world that he wished to leave an impression on. And that was the story of many an athlete. That's why we still talk about these athletes from 20 to 30 years ago. I'm stuck in a jam and need cash right away. Don't worry. Go money line with money grab. With money grab, money transfers are easy, reliable, and fast. No fee if you send cash online. So don't let your fam be broke this season. Go money line with money grab. Now let's talk a little bit about March Madness. Let's talk a little bit about this athletics that's going on now. Can you name Linwood? One top college basketball player that you know of going into the tournament this year. I'll give you two seconds, and then I'm going to jump back into it. Name me one. No. Okay. No. There you go. There's a reason for that. And that's why we're talking about the NIL today. Again, JB, the ticket, Vegas School Board Express, VSX Digital Sports Networks, here with Linwood Hargrot Hamilton, the defender of the youth. And we're talking about the new era of college sports, what it was, what it became, and what it's becoming going into the future going back to that hunger now we're going to talk about the colleges themselves now Linwood, you touched on this a little bit you said something that was very profound and very important to me and something that i agree with totally because i was one of those children college coaches used to come to the inner city to the poor backwoods of america to look for their players very rarely unless it was more benevolence did a high school players high school have the word saint in it. Very rarely was it founded 10 years before that class that's graduating is graduating then. What you saw back then were coaches that, again, people say it was exploitation. I say it was valuable charity, but it was a double-edged sword because you got to think what Joe Jellybean was able to do with Kobe, Michael wasn't able to do with his kids. If you look at Michael Jordan's two sons, and this is going back 10, 15 years ago, but they chose a life outside of basketball. They didn't want to carry on the legacy. Now, some people would say, well, why is that? Well, I'm going to give you the simple answer, the simple reason. Because their dad was a trillionaire. Your dad is Michael Jordan. What hunger do you have? You have no hunger for food. You have no hunger for warm bed. No hung- You have no hunger for anything. If you grew up with that type of wealth, what hunger do you have? Exactly. They, kids are doing now. I think one's a Nike executive, and I think one works for his father at Jordan. That's great. I'm not knocking those kids. But what I'm saying is I began to see it then with the Jordan boys. One went to Illinois, one went to University of Central Florida. The second and third generation players are what we're dealing with now. See, you guys in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, you were playing to get your family and your future family, your children, these opportunities. Okay. But what it did was... It created an environment along with our greater society to touch on that. They started it in the late 90s. Everybody's a winner. Everybody gets a ribbon. Nobody's a loser. Well, then there's no drive. When you were coming up in school, you went through hell. You got If you were fat, you got picked on. If you were slow, you got picked on. The pick on, and they say, oh, JB, uh, you know, you, 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 that was bad. Times have changed. But I'm saying, look what it created, the athletes that that created, the drive. Now, you go to today. That second and third generation child, he's had a warm bed because his dad was Gary Payton. His dad is Michael Thompson. His father's Larry Nance. These kids never had to worry about that. Again, I asked you five minutes ago, can you tell me a top college or high school basketball player, especially with March Madness? You said no. 20 years ago, LeBron James was national news on your local news station, your local sports report. They wanted his name out there. Why? Because the college factory, and this was all players, Carmelo Anthony too. I always say from A to Z. It started with Carmelo from the one and done era and ended with Zion. There will be no more of this. There will be no more superstars made in college. But because of the NIL, I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But most importantly, these second and third generation players, there's no hunger there. What hunger would you have to be exceptionally great If you come from an environment where your endeavors were encouraged more than they were relied upon, listen to what I'm saying. They were encouraged more than they were relied upon. 
Now, Linwood, you can attest to this. When you were coming up out of high school, and I know you were in group family homes, but those coaches, those coaches saw something in you that said, look, we're going to invest our time and effort into this guy because he's going to take advantage of this opportunity. See, now it's not about opportunity. It's about birthright. It's about entitlement. It's about, well, my dad played, so I'm going to play. My uncle played, so I'm going to play. Can I ask you, let me ask you a question. Go ahead. What happened? No one talks about the kids that they used to talk about, like like what you're talking about. No one talks about the kids that are forgotten. Well, let me tell you why. I mean, let, me, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because, again, in the sports world, it's a bread and circus. It's all about value. In the 70s and 80s and 90s, what did America have, which was on front page news, which it's kind of having that problem now, but it's not so much front page news, a crime and drug problem. So because it was in the American public's face every day with the limited media we had, you had three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, pick one. They're all going to tell you something. Peter Jennings, Tom Brokaw, Connie Chung, pick one. But they were harping on the ills of American society. Funny anecdote on the side. When I was coming up, 90s into early 2000s, our NBA players were like gods to us. We wore their sneakers. We wore their jerseys. We did a thousand squats, a thousand toe raises. We jumped until we could dunk, and then every other play was trying to dunk. Jump shot was cool, but if you couldn't cross over and get to the basket, you sucked. And I'm a New York guy. Okay. Now, that was because those players, we could relate to them. They were from the hood. We read their stories in Slam. We read their stories in Sports Illustrated. We read their stories in our local paper, catch that news report. This is before the internet. Even early days of the internet, it was still good like this. So we got a heads up, a background of who could be great, who would be great. There's still plenty of washouts, nothing wrong with that. But just to see those names, especially at the high school level, if your name was in Street and Smith's, you had a chance at life. You could be number 562. Yo, man, I'm in Street and Smith's. Yeah. It gave you a shot. I'm saying that now there are many young athletes and their parents listening. What the heck is Street and Smith's? Look it up. I'm not going to give any... Uh, uh, promotion to any company, but figure out a way to look it up. Okay. So to answer your question, it's not valuable to the universities. It's no longer valuable to the sports leagues because again, what happened, talk about the NBA for many years coming out of the late nineties, the NBA was a league of toughness. It was an urban league. And early on, the NBA didn't embrace the tattoos. They didn't embrace the hip hops because it was real life stuff. Hardcore rappers. Iverson put a record out. Almost killed his career. Thank God he got in the Hall of Fame. But the point I'm making is the young men and women who were playing back then, even basketball, Shamiqua Holdsclaw. I remember, man, she, you know, poor chick from New York coming to the courts, tall, lanky, killing dudes. You know what I mean? She was one of the best. And Where you from, JB? I'm from New York, Harlem, New York. You guys already know JB the ticket stand up. New York. Went to high what school, to the college Rutgers? upstate. What, 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 what happened to the Rutgers? It's all corporate now. It's all corporate now. That's what I'm saying. The value of the inner city athlete is of no more because there's. it's a twofold reason, Limwood, and for all my listeners out there. Mm-hmm. Number, number one is second and third generation players. Those guys from the 60s, 70s, and 80s who went through all that to get rich, their kids who were good enough skill-wise to make it to the pro leagues, aren't hungry enough to become great in many ways with the exception of being Kobe Bryant that I can really talk off the top of my head uh, because they didn't have, they didn't didn't want for anything. I mean, your dad is on TV every week and he tells you it's different when your dad is like, when I grew up, I ain't have nothing. And you're sitting there with 10 pairs of Jordans at 11 years old. (laughs) It's different when you say, Oh man, when I grew up, I had to go to the park every day and prove my medal. When your dad is like, yo, um, wherever my son plays, I'm a play. What? Like You would never hear this 20, 30 years ago. So what I'm saying is going back to the value of the inner city player, the poor rural player, there's no value in picking these kids. Because schools back then had to do work. The academic qualifying, criminal allegations. Come on, man. I was just talking about Allen Iverson. Allen Iverson, if it wasn't for John Thompson, senior, rest his soul. We wouldn't know Allen Iverson because John Thompson Sr. went and plucked a kid damn near out of prison for his potential greatness and cultivated it. 
God forbid you get a traffic ticket today. He'll never hear from you. Got a kid out here in Las Vegas, Nevada, Zion Collins. UNLV could have used that kid this year and last year. But because he went to a high-priced private school, again, I won't say the name, he don't want for nothing. So his drive was to, according to public record, according to news reports, police reports, to find himself driving recklessly and, unfortunately, someone else lost their life. We talk about Henry Ruggs. Same thing here in Las Vegas. I'm talking about what I see here in the streets. This isn't made up. This is stuff you can see. Again, there's no drive for him. He made it to the NFL. He's on Instagram. His drive was, let me do 165 miles an hour down the street. Unfortunately, again, someone lost their life. Again, slow down here in Vegas. When you guys come here to Vegas, slow down. Tip your Uber drivers and slow down. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. And don't get me wrong, there were mistakes made all through sports back in the day. But the point was, the opportunity for redemption was there. Because again, the background of the players and their hunger and their stories gave them these opportunities. But also, the players and the schools knew, especially the schools and the pro leagues knew that, well, this guy's coming from this background. If we work him and he works with us, he can get there. Now, there's no value in that. It's it, it, Colleges got tired of recruiting a kid who was a partial qualifier. We saw it. They made money off it. They showed you. Uh, what was it? Uh, uh, I can't even think of it. Fourth and fourth down and gridiron lights, whatever. It was the Juco football show where they showed you what happened to these kids that fall through the cracks. Most of the, That's where the inner city kids are now. They're at Juco's. They're not playing on national TV. They're not on jerseys that they don't sell the jerseys they're not selling fab five jerseys no more because the school said okay well these kids are complaining about getting paid why were they paying the kids wanted to get paid there was a generation of players pushing to get paid because many of them especially from the inner city that didn't make it to the pros their college stardom was all they had but that goes twofold to what i'm talking about this nil deal they weren't going to pay these poor kids anything. Hey, that's it's, funny. That's funny that, that, that Neil saying that, that NIL, Neil, that with that Neil, means, that, you, yeah, ain't you ain't getting you nothing. nothing. You ain't getting you nothing. nothing. Hey, hey. They ain't telling that, the right? whole generation. No, that, that's the whole point. They're trying to be yeah. funny. That's why they called it the White House. Slaves built it. They called it the White House. Shout out Paul Thank Mooney. You. Again, rest in, rest in peace, Paul Mooney. That's where I stole that joke from. But they called it an NIL, your name, image, and likeness. They call it a nil because that's what it's worth now. And that's what you're going to get. Mm-hmm. Nothing. You go to Christian Leitner's jersey, 1992, that's a hot seller. They had a 30 for 30. The guy made the t-shirts, Catholic versus convicts, making documentaries about the entrepreneurial abilities that were placed around college athletes back then because they were worth something. These new athletes are worthless. That's why you can't name them. That's why you don't hear VSX dropping shows every day telling you who to bet on. I wouldn't tell you to waste your money because I can't sit through 10 minutes of the games launching. I'm talking about basketball. Hold on. Hold on. Let me finish here. These college kids don't have the drive and therefore they don't have the value. And when you talk about that NIL, your name, image, and likeness, it's worthless now. And let me tell you where it ended. Well, I'll tell you where it started. It started with Carmelo Anthony. He was one of the best one and dones ever. The greatest to, to do it. He was the starter of it. Because he couldn't come out of high school, went to Syracuse one year, won the national championship straight to the NBA from A to Z. Zion, he ended it when his foot exploded through that Nike sneaker and his knee looked like it fell off. That was it. No more building up these kids before they can do anything because now he's doing nothing in the NBA. He's injured all the time. But most importantly, from a college perspective, Nike stock went down at least a little bit the next day. And that tells you the value of that athlete. These corporations said, we're not putting no more value on these guys. They're begging for money. We'll give them a deal. It'll be worth nil. See, I'm an old Wall Street guy. <laughs> and I know I'm dropping grease. Give JB the ticket. Vegas grease. Scoreboard Express. Conversation series. Bread and Circus here with Linwood Hard Rock Hamilton, defender of the youth. I'm explaining this to you guys. This is why you don't know who any of the athletes now. It's no longer valuable, especially now for the era of the nil it's no longer valuable for these colleges to promote individual players and make them superstars because when they did that 
Yeah, it made the school a bunch of money, but let me tell you, the schools are still making a bunch of money. And let me tell you how they're making a bunch of money. They're making a bunch of money doing what's called game day sales. You can buy a program. It's got all the players on the front of it, but with numbers and helmets on if you do football. JB. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. I I, got to finish this point. For basketball, it's the same thing. It's a basketball program, a player here, player here. You can't really see his name. It's shadow looking, shadowy looking pictures. 20, 30 years ago, the Fab Five, they were selling long socks at the foot lockers, the mall, the foot action. They were selling five jerseys for Jalen Rose, three jerseys for the other dude, Weber. You could get these college jerseys. How many kids now do you see wearing, let alone college jerseys, an NFL jersey? Unless it's what game What you doing, day. man? Huh? You too thorough. You need to slow <laughs> down, brother. We got a whole lot of more segments to go here. You, I'm telling you, hey man, you giving up knowledge, brother. I'm telling you the truth. I'm being real with you. You giving up too much knowledge in a short period of time, man. I'm I'm getting pissed off now. <laughs> man, I'm that. That's what I'm talking about, my baby man, Linwood, Hard Rock Hamilton, defender of the youth. When we come back on our next segment, we're going to get a little bit more into Linwood's background and more about this NIL. But I'm telling you right now, there's a reason why March Madness isn't on the tip of everyone's tongue. People just aren't interested right now. People are looking at this thing and they're saying to themselves, how can we make money betting? How can we look? Good luck to you if you're going to try that. But let me tell you something. From the perspective of a sports fan, college sports fan, these guys are all milk cart, ladies too. I have no idea who any of these kids are, and there's a reason for that. We're going to talk more about that with Linwood Hard Rock Hamilton when we come back. Linwood, before we get out of here, before this short commercial break, lead us into something great. What are we going to talk about when we come back? Go ahead. Man, I want to talk about you and I, I'm telling you, JB, we going me and you gonna get into it, bro, because I never look, you got knowledge, brother, and you're killing me. And those people, those, you and you young course. kids out there that's listening in college, then I know you're good. I know you're good, and I know you 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 probably think you're great. See right. TV. I want to see you in college. I want to see you getting down. So what I'm saying, JB, slow down. All right, you already know what it is, JB. The ticket. Vegas Scoreboard Express, the Conversation Series, Bread and Circus, Lynn Wood, Hard Rock, Hamilton, Defender of the Youth, JB the Ticket, Vegas Scoreboard Express, VSX Digital Networks. I'm coming back, and we ain't going to slow down. We're going to turn it up. JB the Ticket. You're listening to the boss of the big ball. Vegas Scoreboard Express. Turn that shit up. is right around the corner. Fill out your bracket and watch the games on CBS All Access. Get seven days free at VegasScoreboardExpress.com and then just nine bucks a month. Stay in the game. 